President Vladimir Putin of Russia is a man of many talents, most of them shirtless. He's renowned for his peerless ability to canter on a noble steed across the Siberian plains without a shirt, to catch sockeye salmon in the freezing waters of the Russian River without a shirt, and to fell men twice his size while wearing a mostly unbuttoned judo uniform. But did you know that in addition to all these rugged talents, Putin is also an avid essayist and amateur historian? He's the Russian Indiana Jones, in a sense, if Indy were the villain in every movie. Yes, just last summer, Putin penned a whopping 5,000-word essay entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, all about how they're one people, a single whole. He goes on to question the legitimacy of Ukraine's borders, saying that the country was formed on the lands of historical Russia and can only achieve true sovereignty in partnership with the Kremlin. These theories were echoed in his aggressive speech on Monday when he declared two breakaway eastern regions of Ukraine to be independent. Over the course of Putin's remarks, he detailed a surreal version of Ukraine's history, once again questioning the country's statehood and arguing that Lenin drew its borders on historic Russian land. But as the New York Times laid out, Putin may not have all his facts straight. Ukraine is a patchwork country formed out of Russian and Polish and Lithuanian and Hungarian lands. And Lenin's government actually tried to crush Ukrainian independence by banning their language and their culture not to mention the rather important and very relevant fact that the overwhelming majority of Ukrainians themselves would strongly disagree with Putin's account of their history and basically his denial of their existence. Ukrainians declared their own independence in late 1991, end of the Cold War. More than 80% of eligible Ukrainians voted. And of those voters, over 90% chose independence. That includes over 80% of voters in the now Russian-backed separatist-controlled regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, as well as over 50% of all ethnic Russians living in Ukraine at the time. So, to reiterate, over 90% of Ukrainians approved independence in a free and fair referendum. Putin couldn't even get those kind of numbers for himself in Russia when he rigged his own presidential election. Just saying. So, look. President Putin, it seems as though history is not your thing. I would suggest you stick with shirtless riflery or bare-chested boxing instead. Not history. Joining me now to discuss all of this is Joshua Tucker, a professor of politics and the director of NYU's Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia, and who cited in that New York Times piece on Ukrainian history yesterday. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Uh, Gary Kasparov called Putin's history lesson a screed of ahistorical grievances and delusions. What was your first impression of that speech on Monday? And what do you see as the subtext behind it? So my first impression of the speech was to see it through the eyes of the current politics of the moment, right? So Putin is trying to make an argument here that somehow the rest of the world should see Russia's desire to infringe on Ukraine's borders at this current time as not infringing on the borders of an independent country. So one way that you're able to do this is you deny that the country has its own real history here. So it's also who of was course, sorry, go, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Carry on. So Philip, finish your point. I was going to say it's also the other statement of it is that in the context of the last 30 years, it's kind of a nonsense statement, right? In the context of the international system, in the context of countries in the world today, Ukraine has been an independent country at this point for over 30 years, entitled to the rights and privileges of sovereign nations around the world, recognized by countries around the world. So it's also an kind of incredibly radical statement to try to take a country that has statehood now and to walk back that statehood going back in time. And, and that's something that could happen with lots of countries. So, Professor, who was the intended audience here? I'm guessing Putin didn't earnestly believe that he would convince non-Russians, especially Ukrainians, that this alternate history was true. Why did he go out of his way to write something so detailed last summer and then again on Monday in this long rambling speech? So we can think of two potential intended audiences here. One intended audience might have been China, trying to make an argument that Ukraine should somehow be treated the same way as Taiwan. However, China's never recognized Taiwanese at Taiwan as an independent country, whereas Russia has recognized Ukraine as an independent country. And the Chinese don't really seem to have taken the bait on this in the last 24 hours. That points to the other probably primary audience for this, which is the Russian people themselves. 
any sort of war with Russia, with you between Russia and with Ukraine is going to be costly, and it's going to be costly for Russia in lots of ways. It's going to be costly in terms of human costs. It's going to be costly in terms of economic costs. By arguing that Ukraine is not its own country, that Ukraine is somehow a part of Russia, my belief is that Putin is trying to signal to the Russian people, this isn't the same thing as invading another country, right? This is reunifying our country with the hope that the Russian people will be more likely to sort of line up behind that goal than potentially other goals based around security interests or based around reestablishing the Soviet Union. Yes, and Russia, of course, recognized Ukraine's independence in 1991. When it declared independence, it recognized Russia, Ukraine's borders in 2004 in Budapest. It recognized it in, you know, in the Minsk Protocols a few years ago. Let me ask you this. I asked Masha Gessen earlier in the show, how strategic is Vladimir Putin? How strategic is he or isn't he? Because he's pretty brazen in his actions right now. But at the same time, he pretends to have this polite diplomatic justification for all of these villainous plots. Right. Everyone can see what he's doing, maybe with the exception of the Chinese, as you pointed out. So what does he gain by continuing to kind of politely deny it and play this, oh, this is about our history. This is about, you know, this is about not about just grabbing land. So I think in the West, we often have a time to, we often have a tendency to reify Putin and think that everything he's doing is a stroke of master genius and it's all been sort of planned out ahead of time. Uh, my sense is he's, he's made mistakes before. There were mistakes around Crimea. Think about where Russia would be in the world today. Think about where the size of a con Russia's economy to be today if had they not annexed Crimea. There were mistakes made around interference in the U.S. 2020 in the U.S. 2016 elections, which probably had very little impact on the election result, but led to renewed sanctions against Russia from the U.S. at a time when the parties were fairly uh, not unified. In this particular case here. Putin, in a sense, is being strategic in that he has a game plan and he's and he's sticking to it. And his game plan is to lay out this narrative, right? Then the narrative was going to be there are Russians inside of Ukraine who are being harmed by the Ukrainian government and Russia is going to come to their defense and that this is going to be part of their responsibility because they're really, truly a part of Russia. And this is a story that the Biden administration has quite uh, cleverly been laying out almost one step ahead of time noting that this is what the Russians are going to do, and this is what Putin has gone ahead and done it. I think one question we have to ask, which is you know, really nicely illustrated by the video you're just showing there, is just how isolated Putin is at this particular point in time in terms of the advice he's getting and in terms of the reality that he's believing. We know that as autocrats, when autocrats rule, and the longer they rule, the more the people around them, their careers are dependent on being subservient to the autocrat and in telling the autocrat that the autocrat is right. You throw on top of this the pandemic, where by all accounts, Putin has been incredibly isolated since COVID and really restricting action that comes to him. You can wonder if he's being strategic in the sense that he has a plan, but whether or not he's actually aware of the actual support for this plan, both among the Russian people but also globally. And, and it, you just have to look, if you think that the goal here was to weaken NATO, that the fear was that NATO was getting too strong, it seems that everything he's doing here is actually giving renewed purpose to NATO. If anything, strengthening NATO to a, far, to a level we haven't seen recently. So this is where there's this tension. Clearly there's a plan, but is the plan actually a strategic plan? Is it one that's based in a, a good understanding of reality right now? Fascinating stuff. Professor Joshua Tucker, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your analysis tonight. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.